You could tell they were poor from the offering that they brought, bringing their baby to be dedicated to the Lord. We have a baby dedication coming up in June for little baby West. But, uh, so some strange things happened and strange things were spoken that day. We read about this story in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, story of baby Jesus. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. In this case, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. You can imagine if every family tried to get their baby boy to Jerusalem, the priest probably did a couple of these a day, at least. Probably became pretty routine, but now we see here in verse 23, a new player shows up on the scene. Verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Where did he live? Jerusalem, right. Not, not in the temple complex. There's, a, there's another character in the story a little later named Anna who just literally lives in the temple complex uh, all the time. But Simeon lives somewhere in Jerusalem. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. What is that term? The consolation of Israel. The Messiah. That's right. Waiting for the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26 it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. The Lord's Christ. See, when we say the word Jesus Christ, we think it's like a first and last name. But it's really Jesus the Christ, as in Jesus the Messiah. It's like in this country, we used to say these United States because we were a collection of individual states. And then the Civil War changed that. Now we say the United States, like we say Jesus Christ as if it's one name, but it's Jesus the Christ. And Simeon had had this in, in enlightenment from heaven that he would not die before he saw the Christ, the Messiah. And that morning... He had been inspired by the Holy Spirit to get up, leave his house, and go to the temple. The right place at the right time. God sent him to that place. A great example of being in tune with God. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God, and more appropriately we would say thanked God, blessed God and said, Lord now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. Verse 32, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Uh-oh. The Gentiles? Yeah. Revelation to the Gentiles. And and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which are spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sign which shall be spoken against and then in parentheses there, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What in the world is that? That Christ is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. What does that mean, falling and rising? We see some inferences to that Matthew 21 Jesus speaking here he says whoever falls on this stone will be broken but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder 
Jesus is referring us a prophecy back that Isaiah had written down in Isaiah chapter 8, 14. And he says, he, that's speaking of Messiah, he will be a sanctuary. What, is, what does that word mean, sanctuary? Yeah, refuge, safety. Christ will be a refuge, a place of safety. And to both houses of Israel. He will also be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the dwellers of Jerusalem, a trap and a snare. Many will stumble over these. They will fall and be broken and will be ensnared and captured. See, the truth of the matter is you encounter Christ, you don't remain the same. You fall on the rock. Or you'll be crushed by the rock. Your choice. Left or right. Decisions to be made. It's the great divide. Matthew 12, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. The great divide. This was his plea in John 17 for his church, that they would not be divided, that they would be unified. Amen. Matthew 10, 34, really direct talk here. He says, do not think that I come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword dividing. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her, her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. But who loses his life for my sake... We'll find it. Wow. This separation, it's the great divide. It's in or out. John 6, he said, Therefore I have sent, said to you that no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by his Father. And then you'll remember this one really. It's John 6, 6, 6. John 6, verse 66 says, From that time... Many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. The great divide. Matthew 25, 32. All nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. It's the great divide. This wasn't for the Greeks and Romans. I know everyone looking for Messiah was thinking, we're going to throw out the, you know, the invaders here, the occupiers. This was many in Israel. This child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, in the church. Who gets divided? Who gets shaken out? There's polarization going on. People falling into two camps. And this increases in intensity all through Christ's life. All the way to the cross. In fact, this is increasing in intensity now all the way to the second coming. What groups get divided? All of them. Everyone must choose. Whether you end up being a patriot or a rebel depends on who wins the war, right? I mean, that's how we define it. Nobody's neutral. Everyone chooses. In fact, even refusing to choose, they are choosing. One of the first groups to face the dividing, both in Jesus' day and in our day, is the holders of tradition. Matthew 15, 9, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The traditions, they, traditions may be important. They even may be correct. But are they the word of God? Are people more important than policy? Or is policy the end all? 
Does love transcend denominational barriers? Are you sure? Do we present customs as doctrines? Do we present opinions as doctrines? Another group that suffered division at the sword of Jesus are what we will call the externalists. Those who are obsessed with behavior. The washing of the hands, the edges of the garment, the tithe of the tiny things, the flies in the soup and the gnats in the water. What you brought to fellowship meal, what you're wearing, whether it's inappropriate. Jesus told them in Matthew 23, let you appear clean on the outside, but on the inside you're filthy. Another group to be divided by the sword were the self-righteous. How could they have missed that parable in Matthew 18 about the Pharisee and the publican? How could they have missed it? Or how could we have missed it? Luke 5, the Pharisees and their scribes complained to Jesus' disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered and said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor. But the sick, I did not come to call the righteous, or self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. They have to know that they're a sinner, or it won't work. They're in fact choosing. They're part of the great divide, whether they want to be or not. How do you divide? Will you fall on the rock, or will the rock fall on you? Another group to be divided are the wise. Wise in their own eyes. The people who tried to trick Jesus. Again and again, those with their doctrinal degrees were put to confusion by the simple questions of Je that Jesus asked. Questions that even a fifth grader should have been able to answer. They realized the truth spoken of in 1 Corinthians 3.19. Where it says, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. How about you and me? Too smart for our own good, educated but not intelligent, wise in your own eyes but not in the things of God, think you're smart enough to play both sides, one foot in the world and one foot in heaven, and yet not wise enough to know that that won't work. Liberals also fell under his dividing sword. It wasn't just the high church with its traditions, it was the broad church with its sweeping generalities and its cheap grace and its easygoing theology. Those who just trusted that the leaders, what they said without studying it for themselves, well, that's the way I always grew up, that's why. Those who felt Jesus would save them in their sins rather than from their sins. Jesus' teachings cut that group up as well. It's the great divide. There's a choice to be made. From the time we see that last week's Sabbath school lesson, the call to Cain, that sin lies at the door. You must rule over it. There's a divide here. To Joshua's call, that Earl read from us that text there in Joshua, that it, before they go into the promised land, to choose this day. The divide is here. The call on Mount Carmel, how long will you stand here trying to play both sides? If God is God, follow him totally. To Jesus' call on our life to forsake everything else, pick up our cross, follow him. The challenge comes to you today. The challenge comes to me today. Fall on the rock and be broken or wait for the day when it falls on you and you're crushed. Choose wisely. Choose rightly. Choose Jesus. Our prayer, along with David the psalmist in Psalms 86, 11, says this. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. 
and give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Yeah. Well, let's sing about it. Hymn number 308. Holy thine, totally thine, an undivided heart.